Things are never what they appear. I still remember when I was a normie as a teenager. I basically believed all the normal things for a person who grew up in our society. Then, as I looked for the truth, I started falling further and further down the rabbit hole. Every few years, I've had a major realization that has separated me from the world I thought I knew. I look back upon the boy I was at age 15, and I wish him luck for the adventure ahead. I think this is the third video in a row that's really paradigm-destroying. What you're about to learn here might intuitively make sense to you, although you never had the words before to explain it. It could shatter how you view the world. You might just not believe any of it, and you'd be within your rights there. This is the sort of thing you only hear about in science fiction, but the crazy thing about the world is that reality is stranger than fiction if you know where to look. Part 1, Project Gateway. Hi everybody, I'm Rudyard the Wittafaultist guy, and much as you may choose to not believe me, I do actually have a life outside of this show, and so when I go to parties or dates, it's good to dress well, but also to smell good. And on that second thing, Scentbird is a great solution. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription company that lets you choose a new designer fragrance for every month for just $17, like these ones I got here. You don't have to invest a lot of time or money into designer fragrances since Scentbird offers you affordable ones and different ones each month. They also offer a flexible subscription plan where you can cancel at any time or skip different months. Scentbird carries brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of Rebel. You can be sure you're getting premium scent every month. Every month, you can pick what you receive so there are no surprises. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30-day free supply before committing to a full-sized bottle. Use my coupon code WHATIF for... 55% off Scentbird. It's just over $7 for your first month. Thank you to Scentbird for this sponsorship. Be sure to check them out at the link below. The CIA had decades of research projects into the spirit world from the 60s through 70s. The thing is that they consistently found it was real. They did it since they knew the Soviets were also researching the exact same thing, the results of which we'll talk about later in this video, and they didn't want the Russians to get a strategic advantage. A lot of you might know some of these projects, many of which have basically become cultural memes. People have known about Operation Paperclip, with there being a movie called The Men Who Stare at Goats. The stuff that came out earlier about this largely portrayed the CIA as kooks or weirdos who were investigating things that were inherently strange or silly. It is shocking to see how much the CIA did mold the mid-20th century culture. For example, they astroturfed the entire modern art movement, with most of the early painters being CIA agents and the art paid for by the CIA. This was since they wanted to show the Soviets and the global left that capitalist America was also capable of cultural innovation. They were also big drivers of the early feminist movement, with Gloria Steinem, the most important feminist of the time, being a CIA agent. Margaret Mead, the top anthropologist of the last century who pushed incredible pseudoscience, was also funded by the CIA. Operation Mockingbird was the CIA's involvement in controlling the media and its narrative. Keep in mind this was an era in which there were only three news stations. The CIA experimented a lot with LSD, and supposedly dealt crack in inner-city neighborhoods and cocaine in Central America. To be honest, when you look at the mid-20th century, it almost begs the question, what things weren't government psyops, and if anything was actually authentic. It helps me understand that era of history's obsession with authenticity, since so much of the culture was either managed by large corporations or the government. It sounds like I'm making this stuff up, but I'm not. Look it up. I find it remarkable America is the kind of country which would actually release all the meddling that its secret police was doing. In Russia, China, or I'd even guess Germany or France, this stuff would happen, and we would never know about it even today. This also makes me wonder what the CIA 
Monet is doing now, and how much of our current culture are psyops. I think it would surprise a lot of us. It reminded me of something my father, who's an expert in Marxist literature, once said, in that only the most far-right fanatics were right about what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. The thing is that the CIA was doing that stuff, which was ridiculous, but also at the same time they were doing some incredibly profound things as well. Open onto Project Gateway, the CIA released the documents for this in 2016 to the public and the results are astounding. The CIA had decades of research in astral projecting. What they did is they would play certain sound frequencies for people and then they consistently got hundreds of people to visit the spirit world. In the spirit world, they would speak to different intelligent beings who would talk to them and explain the rules of the universe and the meaning of life or death. The brief for Project Gateway is around 10 pages and it's all free online, the link to which is in the description. I'm honestly shocked no one has tapped into this more, and I'll explain why I think that's the case at the end of the video. Almost everyone they put through Project Gateway visited the spirit world, and this was replicable for decades. The military's independent assessment of the science involved said that it was all correct. They were running multiple forms of scientific tests at the same time on the people involved. They would interview them after, they played sound frequencies for the people, with the sound being the trigger, alongside using meditation and hypnosis to get them to visit the spirit world. Before we get started explaining this in more depth, I'd like to say, I am not a scientist. Science is not a topic I've studied in great depth. I'd like to believe that I've gotten to the other side of the Dunnings-Kruger in the humanities, in which the comprehension of the same historical time period between a person who, say, read 10 books on a topic versus 100 is truly vast, in that once you understand the topic in greater depth, even the most elementary concepts appear different. That being said, I know that I have not hit that in the sciences. There will be people in this audience who know much, much more about this topic than I do, and I'd like them to hold me accountable if I'm wrong. That being said, the reason I'm making this video is I don't think anyone else will. If you're not going to die over it, it's always better to try something than to not try anything. I hope that with this video I can start a conversation amongst people who know more at these topics than I do. They can correct the things I get wrong. As I like to say, my job is betting against God, so there are a million ways to be wrong and only a handful to be right, so... YOLO. I consider myself generally well-read on a variety of topics. I think a big reason people like What a Fault Hist is I'm capable of pulling together ideas in an interdisciplinary manner between history, philosophy, anthropology, biology, psychology, religion, and more. That's something our society is truly terrible at, given we've divided academia up by subtopic so much. Thus, I can cover this scientific topic with a context based out of religion or anthropology in a way that I think would be rare for someone coming from a physics background. Also, a sad truth about the world is that in each topic there are only a handful of experts who can truly understand that field on an intimate basis. The thing beyond that is that those experts are often either a high priest pushing some agenda that they'd like to indoctrinate you in, or they're finding some way to rent-seek, using their knowledge to raise their social status. This is why experts have consistently given incorrect answers over the last century as you can see in this text wall. It's my goal for What If Altist to be a person my audience can trust to do neither of those things. I don't believe in worshipping experts since every class, if you give them power without check, will turn cancerous. So I'm going to give this my shot in the dark as an amateur. The idea behind Project Gateway is that we have right and left hemispheres to our brain. This is somewhat controversial as a theory today, but here's my text wall to explain my perspective on the matter. The left hemisphere creates logical constructions and can only see the world through autistic logical chains or money and power. The right hemisphere can see truth, love, emotions, context, things flowing through time, the world holistically, and more. The left hemisphere can literally only draw half of a painting, while the right hemisphere can do the entire thing. The right hemisphere, when tested, can get the entire answer, while the left will get it wrong. However, the left hemisphere is completely confident in its answer, while the right is humble. The book on this topic, The Master and His Emissary, alludes to this theme with the right hemisphere being the master, who's better at setting goals, and the left 
hemisphere being the emissary who must carry them out. When someone is disconnected from the right hemisphere, they become socially awkward sociopaths. For the left, they can't really do anything, but they feel a profound sense of inner peace. What all these methods that Project Gateway were using exist to quiet down the left hemisphere. By removing the logical structure through which we interpret the world, we are capable of seeing what are effectively dimensions that we would never notice before. The left's hemisphere tethers us to a comprehensible dimension through which we can understand the world. Through hypnosis, the sound frequencies, and meditation, they all quiet down the logical brain in order to open ourselves up to things we would never consider before. These are themes that are common in Eastern religion for millennia. There is a monkey brain, or the chattering inner monologue of useless minutia which fills our lives. By silencing the monkey in the cage that is our mind, we can open ourselves up to the divine in the true form of the universe. In Eastern religions, all the things that Project Gateway had been using have been in use for thousands of years. What we've found from studying Buddhist and Hindu holy men is that their minds literally work differently than most people. For the very holy who have attained high spiritual level, their neurological structures are actually different, and this gives them the incredible physical abilities which we'll hear about, like being able to walk over burning coals, standing on top of pillars for years, living in a dark cave without external stimuli, or light for years on end. This leads to one of the big themes that Project Gateway teases out, that we have far more range in how we wire our minds than what we believe. Let's look over history, in which I will use examples of how mental illness has changed over history. Something I've read is that we don't really have records of autism, allergies, or schizophrenia from the pre-modern world. Instead, you have mental illnesses like entire towns breaking into dance, demonic possession or witchcraft. What this shows is that different societies with different psychological pressures can wire the human brain towards radically different psychological dispositions and create different neuroses and mental illnesses due to different psychological pressures. One of my good friends is a professional anthropologist who lived in rural Cambodia for many years. He said the people there literally believed in magic and actually saw it in their daily lives. They knew of spirits as real physical things. The thing is that this is the way that a vast majority of people over history lived, and probably still a majority of the world's population today. Hell, even in the most advanced industrialized societies today, most people believe in the paranormal. Until the start of the 20th century, the most educated people in the West also did. For all these cultures, they viewed the spirit world as significantly more real than the sensory world itself. What psychedelics are is they create new neural pathways inside the mind. Our brains develop different neural highways over the course of our lives. As an example for addicts, the reason it's often so hard for them to get over addiction is that they've spent their lives using drugs as a way to cope with life itself, and thus they didn't develop neural pathways for other things. The movie Inside Out by Pixar actually does a great example of showing this, with a teenage girl who has neural pathways to her friends, family, hobbies, and dreams. As each of those gets taken offline by personal daily stress, her life falls apart. We only use a pretty small amount of our total brain power and conscious thought. The rest isn't being wasted, but it's being used for the subconscious, which probably makes up something like 90% of our thinking. Our conscious minds are only a very thin veneer. What psychedelics like DMT, LSD, mushrooms, or ayahuasca do is they connect different parts of our brains together in ways that they didn't before. This is why people who use these substances say it's so meaningful and it makes them so creative. Project Gateway never used drugs, but what these substances do neurologically is the same process as what Project Gateway did do in that they block out the left hemisphere to open up to new possibilities that we wouldn't think about otherwise. The theory of mind posited by Project Gateway is that reality is like a radio setting. Think of it this way, bats use echolocution, or the ability to sense the world through putting out what is effectively sound waves like radar. You and a bat can inhabit exactly the same physical place, but your conception of what you see being reality is totally different. Likewise, when Columbus discovered the New World, the Spanish and the natives were standing in the same places geographically, but their comprehension of what was going on was completely different due to their vastly different worldviews. There's a theory that's being batted around for generations in physics. 
This is the argument behind Schrodinger's cat, or that in quantum physics, a particle can inhabit two separate locations at once, but that's not actually how the world exists for us. Thus, the cat, or the particle, exists wherever someone's looking at it. Secondly, the scientific tests we've run have shown that particles move differently based on whether or not we're looking at them. What that proves is that consciousness exists independently, and it does change the material world around us. We've done tests in which we've seen how plants have reacted to the emotions of people who are watering them, and you can tell that the plants are aware of the emotions around them, and they change their structure due to it. Something I'd like to throw out is that our society has no concept about what consciousness is. We don't really have any theories to explain it, and because of that, we're running into all these issues with AI. If we don't know what consciousness is, can we create consciousness? And that's kind of a big deal, because consciousness is what our entire lives are, and when we don't know something, it means there's a theory or paradigm about the world that we're not tapping into. So we should expect that there are things we don't know here. The last Nobel Prize in physics shows that reality does not exist locally. What that translates to is that by perceiving things, we get them to exist. Without perception, reality does not exist. The thing which is so incredibly important about this is that this is what the mystery and esoteric schools of the pre-modern world taught. The Hindus, Chinese, Babylonians, or Westerners all believed that consciousness creates reality. As a general rule, when everyone in history believes in something independently, as is the case with this and the spirit world, that means it's probably true since they're all stumbling upon this shared fundamental reality of existence. The conclusion I'm surprised people haven't reached from this, which the ancients all believed, is that if consciousness creates reality, that means there must be a perceiver to the universe. We've found from geology that the universe has existed for at least billions of years before life. I could be wrong here since I'm not an expert on the topic, but what this has done is prove the existence of God. If someone has to perceive the universe even before life, that means God is perceiving it. And this is the argument the ancients used to justify the existence of God. The ancients said that reality is a dream by God. Before religious people get too excited, everything in physics is fluid and gets very easily disproven. For example, there's lots of people who don't believe in quantum theory and say it's based off a couple faulty experiments. And I'm not a physicist, so I can't speak on this topic with authority either. For a side note, if this is true and we've proven God, that would make this one of the most momentous events in all of world history. What would happen? if science proved God. I think a lot of people would deny it. I think a large part of the population would become religious. I think the social ramifications would ripple across almost every aspect of life for centuries afterwards. An interesting thing is that a world in which God is seen as a scientific fact is called most of history. Go back 400 years and that's the world. The next question is the one which has vexed history in that if God is real, what is the correct way to worship God? And the experiments here don't give a clear answer for that. With all of this, what Project Gateway says is that reality is like a radio, and you can turn it different frequencies. What the author says is that we gradually engineer our brains to different settings. What heaven and hell are is that we've gradually set our brains to good or evil frequencies. Effectively, once they hit infinity, which we'll describe later in this video, you see your neurological structure structure naturally form around you. Let's say, if given infinite time, will you turn good or evil? Hell is the cage you build for yourself in your own mind. Hell is when you're forced to inhabit your mind forever. This is why so many mystics and Christian authors like C.S. Lewis say that we cast ourselves into heaven or hell. There are countless different settings in the spirit world to which someone can wire their minds, which we'll talk about next. For a shameless plug, you guys should check out my podcast, History 102, the link to which is in the description and is on Spotify. We cover historic topics with Eric Torenberg, where I explain things like World War I, the Vikings, or the Fall of Rome being topics, and our goal is to cover the entirety of human history. Part 2, Robert Monroe. The guy who started and led Project Gateway was Robert Monroe. The biggest source for this video is the trilogy he wrote about how he did it, of which I've read the whole thing. 
It's hard for me to summarize everything he talks about, since it's like a thousand pages. So if you're interested, I'd recommend reading it. Robert Monroe was a businessman from Ohio who moved to Virginia. In the 1950s, he started having strange experiences in which he started floating outside of his body, or at least his mind was. He went to multiple doctors and psychologists who basically had no idea on how to deal with this, or to help him. He kept on having his problems, so he decided to go on a journey of self-discovery to see what was going on. Monroe went through this bizarre journey of discovering the spirit world. He would go on trips through the spirit world, speaking to different intelligent species and beings, which would give him information on how the spirit world worked. He started out by doing this himself, and over decades, built the Monroe Institute, which was being funded by the CIA secretly for decades. Everything in this video, which I'm talking about with Project Gateway, is Monroe's baby. The Monroe Institute still exists today, so you can go to visit them in Virginia or download their sound frequencies for Project Gateway off the internet. However, please watch until the end of this video before you decide to do so. Monroe says he never studied world religions, and all the things he talks about are unique to himself and his journey. I genuinely I genuinely do believe that, and having read a thousand pages of Monroe, and as a person who has studied world religions, he doesn't draw logical conclusions in his writing that would be obvious to a person who had studied religion. The things Monroe saw are almost identical to Indian religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism. Reading Monroe is strange in that he'll make very 20th century acronyms for what are concepts that I see as being ancient Hindu things from a 2000 years ago. Monroe saw a spirit world in which different kinds of souls were constantly reincarnating into human bodies. The Earth is a brutal place of Darwinistic struggle, which chews up souls, but who are addicted to the struggle and excitement that is human life. Once a soul gets tired of this endless wheel of life and reincarnation, they can graduate to the next level of development, which is a higher, holier place. A point Monroe makes is that there is a geography to the spirit world. He imagines himself driving down a highway, and there are different off-ramps which lead to different spiritual countries. One is the Abrahamic spirit world, which he never visited. Another is what turned into the Indic spirit world that he saw. There is a large population of ghosts who hover around the earth, incapable of coming to terms with dying. Monroe spoke to dozens of these ghosts, helping them onto their next place. This fits very closely with Buddha, who said some people go to hell, others heaven, some enlightenment, some reincarnation, and others stay around as ghosts. Buddha didn't believe other religions weren't valid, he just wanted to explain the way to his heaven, that being nirvana or enlightenment. The way I imagine this is, as if the Europeans in the 1490s, before they discovered the New World, had different ways of going west to reach the Americas. The Spanish sailed west to the Caribbean, the Portuguese to Brazil, and the English to Newfoundland. The inconsistency of the reports might lead some people back in Europe to think that the Americas didn't exist at all. In reality, these different sailors were just using different routes to reach different areas. If the spirit world exists, why wouldn't it be truly massive with different kinds of geographic regions? The inconsistencies of world religions maybe aren't due to people making this up, rather through using separate spiritual methods they were going to literally different continents in the spirit world. There are concentric spiritual rings around the earth of higher and higher abstraction. The further you astral project out into the spirit world, the more things change from the base reality you and I know. So for example, if you visit your neighbor's house, it will be identical to our reality. However, once you go further back into history, or into different planets, things start to be very different from our world. This fits exactly into what the pre-modern esoteric tradition believed, where planetary was synonymous with perfect. This is easiest to see in Dante's Inferno with the layers of hell. The pre-modern esoteric tradition believed in the seven planetary gods, being Venus, Uranus, Saturn, Earth, and as you ventured further out into space, you saw different spiritual forces before reaching the ultimate which was God. The reason the ancients thought heaven was in the sky was they conflated this spiritual esoteric map of the cosmos with the actual physical world. The reason the CIA was researching this was to use this research in order to spy on the Russians more effectively. Classic US government, 
rather than usher in a profound spiritual revolution, which could completely change the course of history, they were trying to use this to look at Soviet stuff. An ironic thing is that when the CIA released Project Gateway, they removed the page in which they talk about how these discoveries could be used to benefit society and world religions, which Monroe independently released without their consent. The scary thing is that astral projecting was pretty successful. A couple times they were able to get people to completely draw a government installations they would have no knowledge of from blank. They could also mentally project movie images at people and often get them to say exactly the movie that they were showing. They could get people to read statistically significant numbers in rooms on the other side of the country. The problem, and probably why the government dismantled this project, and they might not have, and they're just keeping it secret, is that they could get occasionally incredible breakthroughs that were statistically impossible, but it wasn't consistently effective enough to warrant its continued use. They had hundreds or thousands of examples of finding information through this which would be physically impossible in any other way. Monroe would spy on his neighbors and later ask them at specific details that only they would know through astral projecting at that very time. He used it to occasionally unearth facts from dead souls from previous lives, and then he checked the historic data and saw it was correct. The reason the CIA was interested in this stuff was because they were able to use it enough to learn random things about the world. I've read books which have covered the statistical chances that you can randomly do stuff like this, and it's so low as to practically be impossible. One of the things which really shocked me in researching this video is that we've actually had a significant amount of research into psychics and the research has basically proven that they exist. With exercises like guessing cards or gambling, people's passive psychic ability will increase the success rate a few percentage points ahead of what would statistically make sense. That sounds unimportant, but it's statistically incredibly significant and would not happen without humans having at least some latent psychic ability. That being said, what the research found is that most people are only very weakly psychic. However, there is a tiny part of the population which due to genetic abilities is vastly more powerful. This is something like 1% of the population whose psychic gifts are stunning. These are the people who are drawing secret government installations foretelling the future in probably those who are going the furthest into the spirit world. They were probably called wizards in previous eras of history. Keep in mind, every single society before in history, before ours, believed in magic, and we also never disproved magic as a society, rather we said it just didn't fit into our mental model. It wouldn't surprise me if in something like a million years we look back on the present and realize that we were in the process of evolving a new genetic ability, that being psychic abilities, in the same way that millions of years ago we evolved the ability to think rationally or to speak through language. And over the course of human history we've been able to evolve to have new neurological abilities, so why should that stop now? There is some evidence that you can use the spirit world to figure out how the real world works. We saw this with the Hindus in the ancient world. One of my favorite books is The Eye of Shiva by Amori Duryakur, which talked about how the Hindus reached conclusions about the universe in physics or psychology that we're only just discovering now. Also, the Hindus predicted an age called the Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga is an age of feminine destruction in which the divine appears to be distant. Amori was an expert in Indian history and religion and wrote about how they had a scientific method of religion, how they had holy men who did all of these processes and over centuries compared their findings with each other to create a understanding and map of the spirit world. One of the points Monroe talks about is that the main communication method of the spirit world is NVM. This is communicating psychically through vibes. You know when you have a brilliant idea which just hits you and you immediately envision it? Imagine if you could share all the distraught and pain of when your parents died with a friend. That's NVM. What the other intelligent species Monroe talked to said is that this was their main form of communication. They said humans are strange for not evolving it naturally, as our ecosystem was less cloudy than normal planets. Thus we evolved to communicate through sight and sound, and not psychic abilities. They said humanity had cut itself off from most of the other dimensions and different worlds through not evolving psychic abilities, which are normal in other species. They said the reason we never found aliens is because we were on different wavelengths. Us sending out radio frequencies to discover aliens, they said, would be the equivalent of aliens trying to speak to us 
through car exhaust. Monroe and his crew consistently spoke to different intelligent spiritual forces. In the spirit world, you'll find some humans going between lives. Also, living humans have multiple layers of consciousness. You can speak to someone's subconscious even when they're awake and talking, and they won't know. Then there are non-human species, which Monroe saw as aliens, but are basically angels or demons. They are often happy to talk to Monroe and his crew, and explained how the spirit world worked. Monroe built friendships with many of these beings, seeing them dozens of times repeatedly. The spirit world is largely chaotic, like a jungle or our real world. It's not orderly or safe like we like to imagine, but a natural ecosystem in which creatures have their own motivations, goals, they eat each other, some are stronger than others, and more. It's not a place of peace and serenity. That being said, there are very clearly some stronger and better types of creatures than others. Some of these things were benevolent and helped Monroe, and others were monsters who attacked him. The main way the spirit world operates is that it exists in opposition to our world. Our world is hard, difficult, brutal, and very real and tangible. It's often too hard and too real as we struggle every day to make ends meet. The spirit world doesn't have time. It's infinitely large and thought creates action. The second you think something, it comes into existence. The thing is that this is incredibly boring, and the spirits envy the toughness of our lives. We have reality, and thus have to test ourselves. Thus, the spirits are always struggling to have bodies to inhabit. Some try to demonically possess people, some act like parasites, and they're all happy to incarnate and enter human bodies. Although we may not feel like it, the spirits view our hard lives with jealousy. It's ironic that for much of human history, through religion, has been an attempt to escape to the spirit world. I think the spirit and material worlds exist in critical tension, and like a duality such as man and woman, war and peace, or day and night. The spirits explained life in the universe to Monroe and his crew. The interesting thing is that it basically perfectly mirrored what traditional religion says. They said that we should try to uplift our souls, that we should move past base materialism and survival, that spirituality would make us happy. Monroe saw heaven and spoke to God, while the spirits gave assurance that God existed. The Monroe spirit world is not a Christian one, it being incredibly similar to Indian religions, but they do talk about different aspects and regions of the spirit world which match up with the Abrahamic. The spirits Monroe talked to are basically giving him notes, which perfectly match up with Stoicism and some Eastern religions. These spirits were literally writing essays through Monroe on teachings for mankind, while Monroe himself had no experiences in those topics. Monroe's moral system is that you need to add to the learning and life which is the universe. Evil things are those which drag us down towards base levels. For example, a war purely to justify your own greed is wrong, but a war to spread moral goods or advanced technology is justifiable. The universe is learning through life itself. Thus, it's our duty to live life and experience it, learning and having adventures for God. We really learn through emotions, and we need to teach our emotions to develop through life experiences. The human soul gets reincarnated again and again, and we all have an immortal soul, which exists in infinity. This soul helps us out throughout our lives, and is an accumulation of all of our reincarnations. It keeps reincarnating until it gets bored of this life, and then it reaches enlightenment. Death is an illusion which forces our souls to try harder in our individual lives, so we can learn for God as best as possible. Love is the force which bonds the universe together, in that when we die, we bring the essence of everything we love with us into the afterlife. To finish, infinity is an incredibly important concept for Monroe's worldview. Outside of all of these dimensions is infinity. The universe is predicated upon the existence of infinity. Infinity is the timeless in which quantum physics atoms jump in and out of. Infinity is God. It is the place of peace which all mystics talk about in which everything is unified. The disunity of our world is predicated upon infinity. This is a concept all religions talk about but is closest to the Indian. Infinity is true peace. Part 3. Before you get too excited. I know what I said here might get a lot of people really pumped. That being said, before we get too far, I do want to throw in some mitigating statements. The first being two stories from Monroe himself. Monroe saw that a more advanced species harvested our emotions and life experiences, called Lush, in a farm which they used to power their civilization. He saw the entirety of human existence 
being created and formed so as to be farmed by this society. The second story is that Monroe ran into a society that was on the edge of heaven, but was all based around committees, where their pastor kept them busy with church activities rather than just walking over through the gates of heaven. The reason I'm highlighting these two stories is I think they're symbolic of a very important point. These stories are great symbols of the issues of the society that Monroe lived in. The first one with Louche is that industrial civilization is actually about harvesting our emotions for the wealth of others. Advertisers look at our life experiences and emotions and then commoditize them. The government and powerful subtly manipulate us in a hundred different ways to manufacture consent. This is even more true today with the internet. When Monroe was looking at louche farming, he was seeing a representation of his own society shown through symbolic form. This is something the spirits actually told Monroe. They said what he saw was a representation of the truth, but a skewed perspective on it. The truth is a cone, and we all hug different parts of it. Let me give an example. To the Native Americans, the United States of America was a demon which ravenously destroyed their civilization and their environment for gain. For the Europeans in World War II, we were angels who saved them from the Nazis and then Soviet conquest. The thing is that we're looking at the same country. Both of these perspectives were valid in their own terms. Turn. The Hindus talked about a spiritual dark age called the Kali Yuga, a feminine chaos that would destroy civilization. Their dark age was the golden age of our civilization. This is an issue with the spirit world. As you stare into it, you're also staring at yourself. We reflect our own psyches into the spirit world. Dreaming is a great example of this, where we don't really have any good explanations for why we dream, except the spirit world. Monroe and Amory say it's a daily reconnection to the shared unconscious which keeps us sane. That being said, we all know our dreams are representations of our psyche, which is something Freud and Jung wrote extensively about. In the same way where we don't take our dreams intensely seriously, where if I have a nightmare that a giant dinosaur is going to kill me, that does not inform my analysis that a giant dinosaur will kill me in my real life. And so I think that's a useful principle to apply here as well. We see this in world religion in which they all believe in the divine but have wildly different conclusions. Go back 2,000 years and you have hundreds of local religions which taught different things about the spirit world, all created through authentic experiences with the spirit world on the part of that society. I think the spirit world reflects back a level of complexity appropriate for the societies involved. The God of the Old Testament was so brutal since it was a society where the only motivator that would work would be brutality. That being said, when you're staring into the spirit world, it's not objective at all. What Monroe says is that things exist in the spirit world in a dimension we can't comprehend, so they translate them to physical forms comprehensible to us. If someone from the ancient world saw a spiritual tank, it would translate into a fiery chariot in their vision. The second dream of the town on the verge of heaven is symbolic for the church in the mid-20th century. Most Christians weren't religious in the way they were before and didn't really believe in God. Thus, the church became about itself, effectively turning into a social club and not really believing in God. The church had rejected the insanity of the God of the Bible, instead creating a tame white bread version. The second point I want to make is that for a lot of this, we're dependent upon Monroe. Although he had hundreds of people independently go to the spirit world, the only one we have in-depth writing from is Monroe. Most of the theology here reflects the mind of one man. To be honest, that's true of basically all religions, but is still something to be aware of. There were similar experiments behind the Iron Curtain at the same time in Czechia, which used large amounts of LSD, which came to the same conclusions. They interviewed people off LSD and found basically the same exact stuff as what Monroe did with different details. The Russians had research into this, which I can't find good results for. That being said, Putin's government publicly still says they use psychics and astral projectors, even today, so I can imagine the results were successful. Thirdly, as a word of caution for the people who are discovering this, I know a lot of people who have used the Gateway Protocol unchaperoned. I've personally had some spiritual experiences when I wasn't ready for it, and it can be horrible. I know some people who were already not in a good headspace when they started doing this stuff, and it pushed them over the edge. Some other people where it put them through some weird personality transitions. 
This stuff isn't bubblegum, so be careful with it. We should develop institutions to deal with this sort of thing, to make sure that it's done safely. I know my audience is young men, often of an intrepid and entrepreneurial mold, so you'll do this anyway, but at least your blood's not on my hands. If you do go on to these spiritual journeys, don't take everything you see as complete truth. There will be strange dreams which might haunt you, but are really symbolic of something in your subconscious rather than an external reality. If the aliens tell you you're in the Matrix and you need to start killing people to break out, you're just being paranoid, and it's not the perfect truth. Stay rooted to the Earth. For a final brutal example, to look at a society which gave mystics, of much of Monroe's vein, total power, look to Indian civilization. There is much to admire in Indian civilization, as I said before in this video, but there also is an implicit criticism. India is a civilization run by the mystics and priest classes, and India is the least militarily, economically, technologically, developed society of the big four Eurasian civilizations, and India had an oppressive caste system and was the society which treated women the worst. And if these mystic teachings were the keys to everything, India would be the most successful civilization, but the West who studied the outside world empirically was the one which dominated. Part 4. Why haven't I heard of this? For some frame of reference, all of human history believed in this extra dimension Monroe talks about. The only exception is the 20th century. Even in the 19th century, the occult was incredibly popular in which people like Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, many presidents, and Karl Marx were obsessed with the occult. So, is it too crazy to believe that the 20th century found that this thing that every society believed in was actually true? The thing I find shocking is how little of a wave that this has caused. We literally have multiple government agencies from the world's two most powerful countries saying that we discovered the spirit world. If this is real, it's an event of the importance of the discovery of the Americas, or one of the most important events in history. Meanwhile, almost no one has heard of this. The news never covers this publicly. I only heard about this since one of my friends watches The Y Files, which made a video on this topic. None of my other friends, many of whom study spirituality professionally, had ever heard of it. I think there are two reasons why this didn't make much impact in our culture. The first is that by 2016 when this was released, our society had other issues. We've become so polarized that we didn't really care about anything new. It's crazy to think that we drowned out the news of this due to the Trump election and the years of insanity, including COVID, which have followed since. We are a very short-sighted and foolish society in general, so I'm not too surprised. I once asked my fanbase what they would do if God spoke to them through a burning bush like he supposedly did with Moses. Most said they'd think that they were crazy or they'd ignore it as a hallucination. That's sad. A society that the divine can't reach is a doomed society. We will possibly be known forevermore as those who dawdled on stupid distractions while ignoring that which is truly important which lay right before us. The second reason, and a big part of why the government was hesitant to release this, is that our leadership doesn't want there to be a spirit world or god. If I was in charge of the government in the 60s, I would immediately declassify this, since I would want to help people by bringing them inner solace. One of the points Charles Taylor talks about in his book A Secular Age, which is about the decline in religion we've seen since the Middle Ages, is that one of our biggest reasons is that Authorities, like in government and science, didn't want religion to be real since if it was, they couldn't get power as easily. If there was a god, there'd be standards they'd have to be held against. The ruling class of our society rules through scientism, or the external appearance of science. If you bring god back from the dead, it might make things complicated. This triggers a chain of mass social changes which would probably destabilize those in charge. Keep in mind those in charge largely don't want changes, given when you're at the top, the only way to go is down. In the 1960s, people were largely happy with modernity. It was the wealthiest era of history, society was unified, peaceful, and metrics of happiness, social connections, and sex were the best in history. The post-war period in the West 
was the best period to be a normal person ever. At that point, questioning the assumptions of modernity looked like madness. You wanted to throw away a good thing? However, today we live in a failed society. Nothing works anymore. Under those conditions, you see people questioning the assumptions of a scientistic society since they know something's just not right. This is why Joe Rogan's constantly talking about the spirit world and psychedelics. It's why this research is coming out in physics, and possibly why Gateway was released at all. As life gets harder, we need the divine more and more. Much like the Bible and the classics of Greco-Roman civilization had been lying around for millennia, but the right confluence of variables resulted in them erupting into the Renaissance or Reformation. I very rarely end my videos on a positive note, but if things play out right, we might live to see something stunningly beautiful and wonderful in our lives. Imagine a spiritual revolution. Various techniques, possibly machines and others, so that we as humans could interact with the spirit world and divine on a regular basis. Imagine that. Before we finish, thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video, and check them out at the link in the description. Peace.